Marvin Goldfried is a distinguished professor of psychology at Stony Brook University, where he helped develop the graduate program in clinical psychology. He's the co-founder of the Society for the Exploration of Psychotherapy Integration. Alan Francis is a professor of psychiatry and chair emeritus at Duke and was chair of the DSM-4 task force. Marvin describes the evolution of his psychotherapy orientation as psychodynamic, behavioral, CBT, and eventually integrative. He practices, teaches, and supervises what works clinically using direct and indirect evidence base. Alan describes his approach to psychotherapy as whatever works or no one size fits all. He was trained and taught at the Columbia University Psychoanalytic Center, but remains equally interested in brief, supportive, cognitive, behavioral, interpersonal, and family therapies. Please enjoy this week's episode. I thought it would be a good idea to pick up on on one of the points that we made uh, in our last podcast, and um, because you seem to have a reaction to it, but, but it might be worth discussing. And that was, I was quoting um, Sid Blatt, who uh, was in the psychiatry department at Yale, um, did a lot of good work in training and supervising. Uh, and he said, I am at my best as a human being when I am doing therapy. Well, I, I've been thinking about that all week. And it, it's sort of like in, in a psychotherapy session, every once in a while you say something and the world changes. That really changed the way I thought about my life. It was striking. I've been thinking about it a really? lot. I'd like to hear that. I realized that I have been a much better person as a therapist than I have been in anything else I've ever done. And, and it's weird. Why is that? I came up with three reasons that apply to me. I wonder if you'll, you share the feeling and, and whether your reasons are the same. The first is that it's, I think, the most unselfish relationship I've had being a therapist. The closest thing to it would be how I felt about my kids and my grandkids. But I'm a pretty unselfish guy in most things, but much more selfish in, with my wife or in everyday life than I've ever been with patients or with my kids and grandkids. The second thing is it's been one of the most intimate series of relationships I've had. The, the relationships with patients have in many ways been closer than any relationships I've had in my life, except with my close family and very close friends. And the third thing is that it's a helping relationship both ways. That in some ways I've been able to help patients much more than I've been able to help family members. Family member comes to me with a problem, they don't take me seriously. With patients, I've been able to help them. And also patients have helped me so much that they've made me into a better person. So that's interesting. I mean, there, there are so many different directions to go on this. Um, and, and that is, you know, why? How is it different in, in that regard that allows you to do that? That's one question. The second question, which we may want to hold off on because it'll go off on another tangent, is you once tweeted, that the only thing that an interpretation does is to cure ignorance. But apparently, w these words, which you can consider as a, as a verbal interpretation of sorts, create a profound impact. And the question is why. But let, let's table that for, for another podcast, uh, because the, you know, it will totally bring us in a, in a different domain of, of, you know, what is the process and what are the principles of change? But let's, let's go back to, you know, why? What's the difference? It was like, almost like a switch. When you're, with, when you're with a patient and when you're not with a patient. Well, again, the, the, the first thing that comes to mind is that when I'm with a patient, I care about that patient. I don't care about myself. Yeah. I'm not thinking about anything in my life that's important. I'm thinking about the patient. Yeah. It really no. focuses your attention to someone else's need. And I've never had that feeling nearly as strongly except with my kids when they were young and my grandkids when they were young. Yeah, yeah. No, I, I resonate with that. And as a matter of fact, I think I cheat a little bit in quotes because I tell that to my patients. I say, listen, I have 100% commitment to your welfare. And if you say something or do something that goes against your welfare, 
Um, I'm going to let you know, not as a criticism, but because I care. And that's honest and that's true. And I'm not that way with a lot of people. I've gotten better as I've gotten older. <laughs> partly because you've done it with patience, right? Partly because I've done it with patience and partly because I don't have to worry about advancing my career. And I think, I, you know. Sticking with that third part, the third part that when I said that patients have helped me so much that in, in the lifetime of having close experiences with so many patients, hopefully they get lots out of it, but but so do we. Yeah. And they make us a better person. Yep. Well, you know Bernie Beitman, right? No. You don't know Bernie Beitman? He was the chair of psychiatry at University of Missouri. Um, and he said... Doing therapy is a wonderful way to be in therapy without being in therapy. <laughs> <laughs> and you have lots of different therapists, so you get lots of different points of view. <laughs> so, yeah, no, it's, it's this total commitment to another person. And it, it feel, not only does it feel good, at least subjectively, but research has shown that when people do things for others, they feel better. And this is yeah. above and beyond whatever fee they may give us. <laughs> it's an amazing uh, research literature where we think of ourselves, we think of humanity as being so greedy, but study after study shows that people much more enjoy, get much more pleasure out of giving gifts than getting them. That's right. That's right. What's occurring to me is that we live in a society where that is not valued as much, caring about other people. Um, you go to the Scandinavian countries and it's palpable how different a feeling there is in the streets. Hundreds of bicycles, bicycles are in the bicycle lane and when the light changes, they stop because they care about the pedestrian, or they care about their fellow human beings. I mean, there are just so many instances. Um, I had to go to a police station when I was in Copenhagen. And I walked in and I was welcomed and the people were nice. And I was like, is this a police station? Yes, it is. So I do think that there's a, a lot of the stuff that's going on in society impacts on us individually as people. And we, we certainly know that. And certainly now, you know, talking about, about gender, race, sexual orientation and societal's attitude toward that and how it impacts on a patient is bringing to light all, all of this. Um, but I think we have to talk about the competitive nature of our society. Well, it's really interesting. In Japan, they've had, I think something like 150 is the number of deaths from COVID than we've had. And of course, they've used masks before this pandemic. That's right. But the reason for using masks was always fascinating to me. A person would be wearing, many people might be wearing masks in the subway or in the streets. They'd be wearing the, the mask because they'd be worried about infecting others. It wasn't the fear of being infected themselves, that they were sick and they were protecting the population. And social phobia is completely different in Japan. Here, it's the worry about yourself being humiliated in Japan, it's more the worry about embarrassing someone else. Interesting. So the unselfishness, which we experience most purely in the therapy relationship, is something very special and increasingly rare in our society. Yeah, yeah. Well, look, how many clinicians have seen this phenomenon of a person uh, being distressed or stressed, anxious, depressed, because they have failed at something and they're concerned about what other people will think. Either they've, they've failed at something in their work life or they failed at something in their personal life. And by the way, Sid Blatt made that interesting distinction with depression. He said that, that depressed people in a, in a strange way are perfectionistic. Uh, and he didn't use all these terms. He used a lot of psychoanalytic stuff, which I really don't understand. But, uh, but, it, but to translate it into ordinary language, he said that 
they fail because their standards with regard to interpersonal behavior has not been made. And they think other people are going to think badly of them. Or their standard with regard to achievement is, um, is uh, not being made and other people are going to think badly of them. I think that's one of the things that works in therapy, why we're able to help patients, that they come to us with, with the most shameful to them, shameful thoughts and impulses and experiences. And we listen almost like a confessional without the, the negative judgments they expect and that they've been inflicting upon themselves. That makes them feel better, but it also makes us feel better because we can see the help that we're able to render just by listening empathically. Well, that first part of what you said sounds an awful lot like Carl Rogers. Unconditional positive regard. You accept whatever the person is saying. And, and there's, um, there was a line in one of his books um, where, where he empathizes with the patient as to the change process. And it's like, well, gee, if this therapist can accept me for who I am, then maybe, just maybe I can accept myself for who I am. And his research demonstrated that, um, that the using um, self-reference ratings and Q, the QSOR technology, which I don't think is used anymore statistically, the, the relationship between the way the person viewed themselves and the way they would like to view themselves was much greater before therapy with Rogers or, and Rogerians. And then the correlation became higher. They became more of who they wanted to be. Well, I, I think Carl Rogers exaggerated a little bit in saying it was unconditional positive regard. And I think you illustrated that in your first remarks that you say to patients, I will at times perhaps have to intervene if you're doing something that's harmful to yourself. Yes. You're not going to have unconditional positive regard to things that are clearly self-destructive. And I think that's true in life, that we, it's dangerous to have unconditional positive regard for our kids because they never learn right from wrong. They never learn discipline. We have to have a great deal of positive regard, but not completely unconditional. And I think it's the exact same thing with patients, that when, they, when they're doing things that are really hurtful in yeah. a kind and compassionate way, we're not going to have positive regard for those things. We'll have positive regard for them, yeah. but conditional regard for the things they do. I, I suspect the followers of Carl Rogers believe that much more uh, than, than he did. And in our last podcast, you know, he made that comment on the Gloria tape of um, I don't I don't have to be Rogerian because I'm Carl Rogers and I can do whatever I want, essentially, uh, is, is what he said. And I um, but I do think that um, uh, the followers are just blindly following in much the same way that followers of other orientations blindly follow. Let, let's get back to the intimacy question. What's been okay. your experience of what it feels like what the intimacy feels like with the patients you've treated? You know, it's, it's hard to put in the words because that's not typically how I interact with people. So, and I only have a part-time practice, so I have to go back and think of, of specific sessions. I don't know, it's, um, it's a warmer feeling I have. It's a softer feeling. It's, um, I guess it's a sense of compassion, um, which is, um, it's positive. It's a positive emotion. And it's, it's essentially, you know, if we want to uh, decompose it and, and, and break it down, it's, it's like care, caring unconditionally or caring about another person's welfare and not anything else. And I do think there's a learning process in a very weird way, because I think we as therapists get reinforced for that by our patients. <laughs> respond positively. So, I mean, we, here, here we have a, a Rogers and Skinner uh, meeting. Uh, you do it in a Rogerian way as a therapist. You show your compassion and then you get reinforced by your patient because they improve. It's a, an amazing privilege as a therapist to enter into so many lives so deeply. Um, I've known my patients, I think, much better than I've known most people in my life. Yeah, maybe even the closest people in my life. 
Yeah. Uh, patients reveal themselves uh, in a way that people in other relationships just don't. And also some of the relationships are remarkably enduring. I, I have contacts still with patients I began seeing 55 years ago. Um, and um, I have memories of people who I have, may not have had contacts with, but vivid memories of them uh, decades after the experience yeah. occurred. Yeah. Uh, so some of the most precious relationships I've had have been with, with, with people who gave me the opportunity to, uh, to be with them in a therapeutic relationship. And then it becomes, a, I, I totally agree, and that, but it then becomes a question and becomes a battle within the field. Well, is that, how much of the variance does that take up? And how much of it is technique? And um, there are still people that are fighting as to whether it's the relationship or whether it's uh, the technique. And it depends so much on what is needed in a given case. But unfortunately, I think many therapists who follow a school put the emphasis on relationship or technique because that's what the school of thought says rather than what the patient needs. What do you think about that? The idea that these schools war with one another rather than join together and find what's best in each in an integrated form of psychotherapy. Well, maybe schools of thought should not be proposed until the person has had 20 or 30 years <laughs> of practice and has developed a sense of compassion <laughs> um, and is looking out more for the good of the patients rather than their own careers. I do well, think there is, said, there, there is that tug. It was said in the Kabbalah that you shouldn't study it until you're 40 years old. <laughs> but but getting, getting more concrete, we, the guild interests have been a real problem in psychotherapy, that the different schools are really guilds and they tend to close themselves off from other, other guilds, other schools of thought. Do you think there's any hope now of bringing together the different schools of thought so they're seen as complementary rather than competitive? That's why I'm uh, podcasting. That's why I'm tweeting in the hope that people, that young professionals, that graduate students, uh, that people who really care about the advancement of the field and the, and the health and welfare of their patients We'll put aside these these guild competitions and um, like I've tweeted and, and um, no longer belong to that infamous organization AAM. You know, I don't know if you remember that from one of my tweets. AAM Association for the Advancement of Me. <laughs> and there are a lot of people in our profession who put forth their school of thought because they are charter members of AAM. Uh, and more into the advancement of their careers and the advancement of the field. And I, I think it's sad because I think most of us probably start off by caring about the welfare of, of others and trying to do things. But I think we get caught up in a reinforcement system uh, where we get rewarded for certain kinds of things. Well, isn't the problem in the uh, training programs? Partially in the training programs, but I think it's part, and I think it's also the con, the reinforcement contingencies in the world. So the reinforcers for somebody in academia are not the same as the reinforcers of somebody who is in practice clinically. Now we're getting off on a tangent, but then again, um, those graduate students who looked at the first uh, dialogue that we had in our podcast, said, yes, do tangents. They like tangents. I don't even think this is a tangent, Marv. I think that basically the question is how much we as therapists, everyone as a therapist, how much is what we do in the room geared to what that particular person needs at that particular moment versus well, I, into the experience having our own preconceptions having a hammer that we're going to hit every nail with yeah, yeah. and doing the same kind of procedure on everyone we see rather than thinking of ourselves as customizing the treatment. I, I think, 
Yeah, I, I think practicing clinicians will say, yes, I have grown and changed over the years um, because I find that certain things work better than others with my patients. So they become more integrative. They do borrow from different other schools of thought. But I do think that schools of thought exert a power on the field. These clinical trials that have been going on for the past several decades, typically it's a school of thought that's compared with another school of thought. And you get a random assignment to one or the other. Yeah. Ask any practicing clinician or ask a supervisor, do you tell your supervisees to just randomly pick a treatment if somebody is depressed? Or do you try to tailor make it to, to what your case formulation is? And there's this gap that, that exists. You and I were there at the beginning of this. In, in the early 80s, we first met on an NIMH study group that was yeah. funding the early studies in psychotherapy that funded CBT, that funded DBT, and nothing could ever get through that committee unless it was very narrowly defined. The focus was on internal validity, being able to interpret the results of this study. It had nothing to do with external validity and generalizability to the real world, where you would have to be much more flexible. Yeah. The startling, striking example of this is CBT. So I've been very friendly with the Becks. And they manualized cognitive behavior therapy because they had to to get funding from us. But they don't teach a manualized form of cognitive behavior therapy. They wouldn't dream of this being the standard for clinical care. But somehow or other, the perversion over the years has been to make the manual the standard of care for cognitive behavior therapy. Yep. It's something that was created strictly for research purposes. Right. It's now become something that's misapplied in everyday clinical practice. Right. So I'll tell you something that, that I don't think I've ever discussed with you before. Um, you know, the collaborative depression study, which compared cognitive therapy, ex cognitive therapy with interpersonal IPT. Um, for depression, okay? And you do one or the other, you follow the manual and you make sure you stick with the manual and you don't tread on the other orientation. I once asked two of the authors of the Beck et al. book, if you have a patient who's depressed because they have a complicated grief reaction, would you use cognitive therapy? And without hesitation, they said, no, not at all. They said, I would do grief work. But I said, but grief work is part of interpersonal therapy. And they say, yeah, but that's what I would do clinically. So what a vivid illustration. It's striking that interpersonal therapy for that study was developed by Jerry Clerman and Myrna Weissman, two wonderfully smart people who had almost no clinical experience. So again, it shows how the research to some degree has been enormously valuable. If we didn't have the research on psychotherapy, it wouldn't be at all compensated. It wouldn't be nearly as much used. The, the research on psychotherapy has been enormously useful, but it's had the one negative effect of making people think that you would actually do the clinical work in the rigidly outlined way of the manualized research study. That's why it's important for us to the podcast and have other, pe have other people listen to us because we've both done research and clinical practice. So we have a foot in each camp and we know the, the, what's required and what the constraints are and what the stresses are and what the reinforcers are in, in each of these. Uh, and, and the importance of balancing the, the relationship, which is crucial with the techniques, which are also crucial and not overemphasizing one to the expense of the other. Yes, yes. And I think, I know within CBT, and I men we mentioned this in passing last in our last podcast, with CBT, the impression is from the manuals that it's the technique that's gonna pre create the change. And while the man will say, make sure you have a good relationship, the relationship is more the context 
within which you use the techniques. So research has shown that um, primary care physicians who have a good relationship with their patients are more successful. Well, the relationship probably doesn't cure them of their bodily problems, but it probably gets them to do the kinds of things that medically are important that are being suggested by their primary care person. So within CBT, the function of the relationship is to get the person to engage in the techniques. And there's a certain amount of truth to that. I think we're going to have to stop, Marvin. Can I suggest a topic for next week? Sure. How about if we discuss magic moments? How therapy doesn't work step by step by step by step. It works by step by step by step and then giant leap and then step by step by step by step. That sounds good. That's how we started uh, today's uh, podcast. I think remember because when I made that quote from um, uh, uh, on uh, I'm at at best as a human when I'm doing therapy, that was a magic moment for you. So you can start by unpacking that. And how did that make an impact emotionally, not only just intellectually? um, And how is that related to the change process? Well, Marvin, this is fun. Okay. I, help, I don't know if it's helpful for people. I hope it is, but it's certainly fun for us. It certainly is. And um, I, it's good. I, I'm not going to take my medication for today because I feel so good. <laughs> See you next week. Stay safe. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.